نستغفره ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما فإن أصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by thanking Him for all of the blessings that we cannot even list, that we cannot even count, that He has given to every single one of us. Blessings that you and I are aware of, and blessings that you and I have absolutely no idea about, like the beating of our hearts, like the neurons that are firing in our brains. We have no clue about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows these things to happen in such a harmonious fashion, yet we praise Him and we thank Him for all of these blessings. Verily, whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, there is none that can misguide such an individual. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to go astray, because of their own rebellion, because of their own argumentation about Allah and His Messenger وسلم, then such a person Allah allows to go astray. And Allah, it's only up to Him whether He will guide such a person back or not. But when a person is misguided, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this person to be misguided. And none can guide him or her back except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself. We bear witness and we testify that there is no deity that is worthy of our worship, our love, our fear, our hope, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we bear witness and we testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and his final messenger, his perfect worshiper, and the example and role model for humanity until the end of times. Dear brothers and sisters and my respected elders, in today's khutbah, I want to share with you an example from the seerah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the community building policy that our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had in the young Muslim community that was forming in Medina. And in order to fully appreciate how the Rasul, peace be upon him, built individuals, built a vibrant, a strong, a spiritually strong community, in order to understand and fully appreciate that, we turn to the Qur'an. A, an ayah that belongs to the seventh surah of the Qur'an, Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 199, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a three-part rule or manual, if you like, to the Prophet, peace be upon him, on how he should conduct himself. And the result of which would be such an incredible generation. A generation that you and I look up to. And you and I just wonder in amazement, how did that generation come about? That the generation of the Sahaba, a group of people, desert dwellers, who were somewhere in the desert, and within a few decades, managed to turn the course of history. How did that come about? I hope that inshallah ta'ala in today's khutbah we can shed a little bit of light upon it. And your assignment for today is to go back home, open up the Mus'ad, open up the Qur'an, to Surah Araf, Surah 7, Ayah 199. Open this Ayah, read the translation, understand it, listen to a couple of tafsirs if you like, and make a firm resolve to lead your life by it. So what is this ayah in question? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ خُذِ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرُ بِالْعُفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ An extremely short ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, a rough translation of this ayah is, 
take what is given freely. And enjoin that which is good. And turn away from the ignorant ones. Now, this is what the translation says. Let us pay closer attention. The ayah begins by a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is commanding the Rasul, peace be upon him, and by extension, all of us, all believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, take what is given freely. Now, let us look at the word take. The word khudh, which is translated as take, comes from the Arabic that means something that is given to someone. And you take hold of that. أخذ يأخذ أخذ. Okay? But this translation is just one dimension of what this word communicates. We turn to the Quran to see other instances where this word occurs. And there are several. I'll share with you one such instance. This instance occurs in Surah 19, Surah Maryam, ayah number 12. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands John, peace be upon him, the Prophet Yahya alayhi salam, and says, Ya Yahya, khudil kitab bi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O Yahya, O John, take hold of this scripture with determination. Khudil kitab bi What does this khud mean? It means not just take, but hold on to it firmly. When you turn to the Hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the 10th year of the Hijrah, the Rasul, peace be upon him, performs Hajj, Hajjatul Wada. And he uses this term. He says to the companions, Khudu anni manasikatun. Take from me the actions, the worship of Hajj. In other words, the Rasul, peace be upon him, is not just saying, just take something very lightly. No, no, no. What he is saying is, note down very, very carefully, very, very diligently, note down every single action that I'm doing, and make that your rules and regulations book for how to perform Hajj. So we understand, when Allah says khuz, it just doesn't mean just take. As you were just seeing in translation in passing, there's much more. Now, having understood that, Allah says, Khudil Afwa. Take or make as your guiding policy what? Al Afu. What does Afu mean? There are a number of meanings of Afu. From them is the meaning that you and I are familiar with. In the month of Ramadan, we all know our mother Aisha anha, asked the Rasul, peace be upon him, what dua should I make if I were to witness Laylatul Qadr? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the famous dua you've all memorized, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afu fa'fu anni. Same word, al-afu. So what does afu mean? Not something just freely. Afu also means, from the meanings of afu is to not mind, to let go, to forgive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah, your life policy your policy in building a community should be that you let things go. Make this a policy of your government, Ya Rasulullah. Allow things to slide. Be gentle. Don't be harsh. You know what the manifestation of this means? What this means is somebody says something to us within our own community or outside of it. Someone says something that we find derogatory, that we don't find good. Let it go. Who says that you must jump onto every single thing they say? And unfortunately, the tragedy of our community, O oh Muslims, is that we've become so petulant, so childish, that every small thing that every single person says, we jump at it. That we are at the throats of our fellow believers. Why? That the smallest thing riles us up. That someone says something, and we cannot give them, him or her, the benefit of doubt anymore. That there must be an ulterior motive. That that person said, did you see the way that he or she looked at me? Did you see their body language? Did you see? SubhanAllah, let it go. Khudil afwa. If you're after every single person, double, triple, quadruple, guessing their niyyah, their intention, which by the way, cannot be known to you and me. It's not only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's something of the heart. How will you grow as a community? This is what the Rasul, peace be upon him, taught the Sahaba. 
خُذِ الْعَفْوَ Let go. Let things be. If someone comes to you, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in an authentic hadith, الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Listen carefully to this. الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَيِّنُونَ لَيِّنُونَ That the mu'min, you want to know the quality of the believer, is what? The one who simply says, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ حَمْدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ the one who simply wears the topi, has the longest beard, and mashallah ta'ala has the biggest mark on their forehead and coming to the masjid five times a day, along with all of these things, what? Someone, the Rasul, peace be upon him, said two qualities. Learn to be gentle. Learn to be soft. Don't be harsh with people. Now, I'm not saying you subject yourself to abuse. I'm not saying that. Use your best reason. Use your common sense. But every single thing shouldn't cause us to get riled up, to lose our temper. And this happens not just in the community of Muslims, even inside of the household. That the father is treating his children with sarcasm. That the wife and the husband, they're always going at each other. What are the kids witnessing inside of the house? And now when the kids have become teenagers, the father said, oh my God, how dare he? He just replied back to me. And the mother is wondering the same. Well, where did they learn it? have this attitude of being gentle, the child is witnessing. In fact, a non-Muslim child psychologist, he said something so profound. He said, in so many years of my research, what I have seen is that children have constantly failed to obey instructions. Instructions that you give by the tongue, by the mouth. Beta do this, or son do that, or daughter don't do this, or don't do that. They've constantly failed to follow that, but one thing they've never failed is acting the way their parents did. So you and I, when we're faced with problems inside of the house or outside, your children are watching you, even if you think they're not. And when they see dad, he has patience, he has sabr. They will learn that. They will learn that from you. Oh, Muslims, the Quran is not a book that you just read and that's it. You will read it, you go deeper, you try to study it further. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Such a short ayah and our time is almost gone. Khudhi al-afwa. What's the second thing? Wa'mur bil-uf. Enjoying that which is good. Wa'mur means to command the good. Now commanding the good means you encourage people. You may be a manager, you may be a supervisor, you may be you know, an older sibling inside of your house. MashaAllah, we have young ones here today. Treat your younger ones with kindness, with gentleness. Push them forward with a positive message. That is the point. And to make, give you a simple example, you may be in charge of a project at work, and you have this particular individual under your command. And you've asked this person to carry out a particular project because you think he or she is capable. And they mess it up. And you remind yourself, you know what? Allah says in the Quran, Khudil Afwa. I let go, no problem. They do it a second time, they mess it up. Now, you're getting a bit irritated at this individual. You say, you know what, I'll give him or her a third chance. Give them a third chance, they mess it up. Now, they have gotten on your nerves. You are wondering what to do, you give them the last chance without telling them anything, and they get it right. Now, in this moment, your reaction will determine whether you're someone who builds individuals, who builds communities, or you're someone who tears people apart. Or you're someone who tears communities apart. Your reaction in this moment. Is your reaction going to be that of sarcasm? Oh my god, you're such a genius. That you're not a fool after all. MashaAllah. Let me take a picture and put it on Snapchat. You really got this thing done. I didn't know that every part of your being wants to say something sarcastic. But you gently encourage and you see where these people will get. At this very musalla, I gave a series of khutbahs on lessons from Uhud. What happened in Uhud? You all know. The Muslims faced a defeat. Why? Because the Rasul, peace be upon him, commanded in no ambiguous terms, very clearly, the archers, that you have to stay at your posts. Under no circumstances should you descend. They disobeyed the Rasul, peace be upon him. The Prophet's uncle was mercilessly killed and mutilated. The Rasul, peace be upon him, sustained injuries. He bled. His helmet broke and 
and shards of it went into his cheek. His molars were broken. His face was bloody. He was knocked unconscious. Only Ms. Pablo were murdered and killed that day. What happens? Rasulullah, peace be upon him, could have told those 70 companions that disobeyed his command. And they descended from their positions. Could have said, all of you get out of my face. All of you must be executed. All of you, and whatever. But the Rasul, peace be upon him, did what? Because the policy was, He let go. He forgave. Having understood that here is the entire record of all of these individuals, if amongst all the good things they've done, one mistake they've done does not write them off. I cannot blacklist them. Think about how your and my reaction is with people who are close to us. Think about it. And now you'll have your answer why the community or the ummah is at the state that it is at. Until you and I, all Muslims, do not take positive efforts in understanding the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then things are not going to change from them. The Rasul, peace be upon him, embraced them, consoled them, encouraged them. He understood that these people did not deliberately do this to bring about a defeat, did not deliberately do this so that I can get injured. No, no, no. That was a genuine mistake. And these same individuals would go on later to bring victory to Islam. Be gentle. Don't be harsh. And encourage people with a positive message, not with sarcasm, not with negativity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to that which is right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and minds to the book, to the sunnah, and the example of our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. الحمد لله الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وبعد. The third and final advice of this policy that Allah سبحانه وتعالى gave to the Rasul peace be upon him was وأعرف عن الجاهلين the last part and turn away from the ignorant. What the Rasul peace be upon him is being advised and being told by Allah سبحانه وتعالى is that there will be elements within the community who are committed to negativity. Who are committed to pessimism, who have nothing good to add to the good work you're doing. So when you know that you are following the Quran as best as you can, you're following the Sunnah of the Rasul, peace be upon him, as best as you can, and you're trying to follow that in your household, and you're seeing the positive results of it in your family, and in the workplace, maybe you're in a place of leadership, in the community, there's so much good that is coming, you're building people, you're growing people, then these haters, if you like, in our political terms, take them away from your life. Who are there committed to simply undermining your work on social media, you see them character assassinating you, block them. They're trying to friend you, reject them. No need for you to be distracted because these people are nothing but a nuisance, nothing but a distraction. So when you become riled up and get busy with addressing every single naysayer outside, forget it. That is not your job. Let them be. You remain focused at the task at hand. And that is what the Rasul, peace be upon him, is being told. And especially in the times that we are in, it's the election season, I'm someone who firmly believes the member of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa the Jumu'ah khutbah, is not a place of a political form. It's not a place of a political platform where you start, start talking about political parties and this, that. No, not at all. This is a place of mu'ayla. This is a place of reminding the people. But there are certain times when the circumstances dictate that certain things must be mentioned. And in that light, I want to mention to you that looking at the election season that has come upon the Muslims, that has come upon this country, alhamdulillah, the federal elections, there are those elements within the community who are spreading confusion and saying that don't vote, voting is haram. Don't vote, voting is shirk. And they will bring ayat and ahadith and try to confuse the masses. So I want to set the record clear for you that the primary ayah that they bring, and there are a number of them in the Quran, from them is Surah Ma'idah, Surah 5, ayah number 44. Towards the end of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whoever 
believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought down this law that there can be another law through which mankind and humanity can be governed, then such a person is a fa'ula'ika hum kafirun That's what the ayah says. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الْكَافِرُونَ The ayah is explicit. So they say, hold on a second, you know, when you go to vote, what you are actually saying is that the Constitution, the Charter of Rights, that man-made laws are higher than the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the answer is, nobody in their right mind, no Muslim actually thinks in this manner. None of us. When we go to cast that ballot, None of us is thinking that Allah's Sharia is lesser than man-made laws. Nobody thinks that. The reason why voting, inshallah ta'ala, is a rewardable act is so that you are sending a message to those in government that we Muslims cannot be ignored. And that is good enough, in fact not good enough, that is one of the major reasons for which you have to show up. Get out and vote. Go and vote. And if you still believe that it's kufr, shirk, haram, and whatnot, then jazakumullahu khayran. Keep that to yourself. Nobody's forcing you. You have your way. We have ours. It's simple as that. And it doesn't take, I don't want to be harsh, it doesn't take rocket science to read those series of ayat. Look at the beginning of what this ayah is saying. Allah is addressing the people of the book. And those who are considering accepting Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them that if you have accepted Islam and you still feel there are other forms of governance that are better than the lawgiver, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in that case, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الْكَافِرُونَ There's no doubt about this. All of us believe this. That there is no lawgiver higher than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody is claiming that. So you and me going to vote has absolutely nothing to do with banking partners alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So please, when people come to you trying to confuse you with ayat and ahadith and things like that, and my time is up, do not let them confuse you. Tell them, thank you very much, Jazakallah khair. And they will quote you fatwas from distant lands, thousands of miles and kilometers away, and say, hold on a second, look at this is what Peer Sheikh Saab, Mufti Alim, Sheikh al-Islam says. And that is not your concern. There is no proper alim from the ulama class in North America of high repute who says that voting is haram. Nobody says that. Because you know what's going to happen? When you don't go to vote, what's happening in Quebec, where they're banning the face veil, the niqab, and then the hijab, later on when you're absolutely not caring about your civic duty of voting, these will be the very individuals who will come and say, hold on a second, the law is coming that they want to shut down the masjids. You know what, now we can't even do this, you can't even do that. Then who, who is going to be blamed? Well, you never showed to the people in power that you matter. Then why should they even care about you? Then you become another Modi's India, where the Muslims who were not that active in the civic process, what happened? Draconian laws are being passed. And we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this. So my advice to you is remember, not so that you forget the rest of the khutbah, then remember those who are naysayers, those who are coming to distract you, don't get distracted. Remember that our mandate is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking his pleasure, and inshallah ta'ala, uh, being on the path of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until we make it to paradise. That is our mandate. So let not let anybody distract us from this goal and hand. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala have mercy upon every single one of us. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala have mercy on all of those who have passed away. There are some within the community who have passed away. From them is a brother whose father died. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to grant him the Jannat al There's another sister who is in critical care in the ICU. She's on life support. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to grant her ease that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her a quick and speedy recovery and that which is best for her. We beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon the Muslims around the world who are subjected to unspeakable atrocities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes ease for them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on account that he has not tested you and me with that severe test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to become better Muslims, to become practicing Muslims and make us role models for the next generation to come. أني يا رب العالمين عباد الله رحمة الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى من أن يتقشى إلى منكم والبغي يأمركم بالعدل والإحسان